My name is Karen Hutchinson. I'm a mental health student nurse at Teesside University, cohort 2009. Today I'm going to discuss Karen Manton's story for the purpose of this assignment. Full consent and confidentiality has been maintained to the School of Health Social Guidelines. Karen is a 51-year-old woman. She's very happily married with two grown-up children, whom she is extremely proud of. She also has a cockapoo that keeps her busy and provides Karen with a lot of comfort on her not-so-good days. Karen first became aware of her mental illness at the age of 17 years, which was around the time she had started her first permanent job. Unfortunately, there was a lot of protesting and quarrelling going on in the office. This was stressful for Karen, as she was also having issues with a long-term relationship, which added to her stress. She found herself not being able to sleep at night, to the point where she was unable to sleep for seven days. This was causing her to lose concentration at work. Unfortunately, her parents were not aware of Karen's illness and did not recognise just how ill Karen had become. Her manager informed her parents about what was happening at work and how she was making a lot of mistakes. At this point, her mother took her to the GP. The G GP diagnosed Karen with anxiety and depression and she was given a course of antidepressants. She was also referred to a psychiatrist who had very little to say to Karen and she was soon discharged. Karen didn't have any power or control about what was happening at this point. As stated in the NMC, the psychiatrist should have treated Karen with kindness, respect and compassion. Karen should have also been given personal centred care and the psychiatrist should have looked at the whole picture. It took many months for Karen to become well. In this time, she made many attempts to return to work. Unfortunately, she had her first taste of stigma. Stigma causes increased distress for those with a mental health problem and can prevent them from seeking help as early as they otherwise would do. It can cause stress for the families and lead to employment discrimination issues. Members of Karen's own family were unsupportive and often humiliated Karen. And Karen describes her feeling as confused. This situation may arise due to stigmatisation of the mental condition and negative attitudes among healthcare practitioners and a lack of confidence in clinical skills and re recognition, stated in the RCNI. Six years later, Karen became ill again in 1992. This time she was sectioned for a week. Karen went on to be ill every two years until 2002. In this time, she was sectioned for five to six weeks for most of those episodes. This was due to medical staff failing her the correct diagnostic. It was a case of taking the tablets to become well Stop the tablets to be discharged from outpatients, then become ill again, which was a very repetitive pattern in Karen's life. From a biopsychosocial factor, Karen felt left, let down and failed by professionals and her family. The stress of work, her relationship problems and lack of sleep could have all been the trigger to her illness. Karen also suffered negative experience and lack of person-centred care from the psychiatrist who, wrong, who wrongly diagnosed her condition. By 2002, a new consultant was on board who diagnosed Karen with bipolar disorder. <clears throat> Good quality nursing can make a substantial different quality of life for the service user. Bipolar disorder is a common long-term medical health condition characterised by an episode of mania or hypermania and depression, resulting in disability, early death and high health costs, stated in the NICE guidelines. Karen was given a misdiagnostic of anxiety and depression each time she was admitted to hospital and given the wrong medication. This is classed as diagnostic overshadowing. Diagnostic overshadowing occurs when symptoms of physical illness are attributed to the service user's mental health illness. This increases the delay in development of a complication, and that was stated in the RCNI. No one ever tested her for bipolar until she admitted herself to the hospital as she knew she was becoming unwell and had developed a great insight into her illness. The staff sectioned Karen again. This caused Karen to become so distressed she appealed and the section was lifted. Karen wanted to work alongside her consultant to get things ready for her return home. At this point, Karen used empowerment and took control of how she was being treated by medical staff. She should have be been given information, support and given personal centred care as stated in the NHS England. Power balance should have been put into place in Karen's care and the nurse should have respected Karen's rights 
to influence the care she was given. Also, support for detained patients to make decisions should be available. People over the age of 18 with the capacity to do so may make advanced decisions to refuse specific treatments under the Mental Capacity Act 2005. Karen was given the wrong medication for 16 years. This should have been evaluated correctly, where staff would have realised it was not working correctly for Karen. From a, from a professional background, what should have happened? Measures should have been taken to reduce the likelihood of mistakes, near misses and the effect of harm. As stated in the Human Rights Act 1998, public authorities must make sure they follow the guidelines when they provide healthcare services. They try to discharge Karen, but both she and her consultant fought to keep her in the system, as it was evident that, th that this had kept her well for over 18 years. We have a responsibility as professionals to empower our patients to make informed choices about their care. Karen's consultant act as, acted as an advocate on Karen's behalf to keep her in the mental health system. Act as an advocate for the vulnerable and challenging poor practice and discriminatory attitudes and behaviours relating to their care, as stated in the NMC. As a nurse, listening and communication is central to a successful caring relationship. Commitment improves the core and experience of our patient and helps physical, mental and social needs. The MCA Act 2000 provides a legal framework for decision making in the best interest of people who may lack capacity. Karen still takes medication and attends outpatient appointments after a long fight to stay on the mental health register, as this has kept her well for 18 years. Karen feels betrayed and has lost a lot of years of her children's life. She feels sad that her children seen their mum so poorly. She lost her trust in the medical sector due to the wrong diagnosis and mental health services had failed to recognise her condition. This has inspired Karen to support other people with mental health illness. She became a mental health campaigner and has spoken to a local radio and is taking part in magazine and podcast interviews. Karen hopes to manage her illness, recognise her triggers while continuing with the gym classes, her dog and socialising with her loving family and friends. She also wants to help others so they don't have to go through what she did. Karen should require help and support from community health and support workers in the future and keep all medical notes up to date to help take control of her, of her illness. From the NHS website, from a professional background, what should have happened? From a holistic approach, care should have been delivered to help Karen and compassion should have been involved in building a relationship with a patient based on em empathy, respect and dignity. The staff should have been competent in a way to understand the individual's health and social needs with expert clinical and technical knowledge that was based on research and evidence. Professionals should consider the principles that the Care Act introduces the centrality of the patient and the holistic approach to care and support. These are in line with the guidance principles proposed in, the, in this code, Mental Health Act 1983.